Coming up on this week's show, the Oliver Twins announce a new collection. A lost sim game has been found. And we talk Amiga after Commodore. Today's episode is brought to you by Beer 52, the world's most popular craft beer discovery club. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 228, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And it's that time of the week again when we get our retro on, reminisce about all the happenings in the world of retro gaming and technology over the last seven days and bring you a very special guest as well. Can we just take a moment as well to say a very happy birthday to our main man of rock and roll on the Retro Hour podcast. Happy birthday, Joe. Oh, cheers, man. Thank you. (laughs) Did you have a good retro one and get some retro gifts? Uh, I did, actually. I got a couple of retro gifts, to be honest, uh, which I'm going to do a little video about, uh, which hopefully should be out in the next couple of weeks, um, which we'll post on the page. What was it like having a birthday in lockdown? Uh, It was was all right. Like, my wife got me some really nice stuff. Uh, And my mum came and saw us and she brought us a McDonald's. Nice. um, (laughs) And we ate it in the garden and we walked the dogs. So it was all right. And... (laughs) It wasn't a big birthday, so... I remember last year you actually broke your leg on your birthday, didn't you? So pro- probably safer yeah. than you did it in lockdown, actually. <laughs> yeah, it was a safe one, this one was. I remember uh, you and you and your wife turning up and it was like, where's Joe? He's in hospital. <laughs> that is how metal Joe is. <laughs> <laughs> or clumsy. <laughs> now, we have got some good stories to talk about on this week's show, including the Evercade reviews are in. Now, I've been seeing this everywhere, obviously, a story that we've been talking about on the show for a couple of months now. And there is a brilliant new collection by the Oliver Twins that we'll talk about and we're going to be getting the story of the Amiga after the Commodore years so now Ravi actually this is quite good timing for you you've been doing this um, little series of videos on YouTube kind of exploring that because you'd notice this kind of trend as well that most of the Amiga history kind of cuts off in like 1994 when Commodore went under yeah a lot of people kind of don't actually realize many companies had Amiga afterwards which were companies like Escom which were the huge PC retailer uh, Gateway as well, Gateway 2000. They were the big PC retailer. And, you know, there's kind of an existing community with Amiga and it's kept going all this time through all these different companies and no one's really covered it. So I did a little video on Escom and uh, that's really interesting. But we've got Trevor Dickinson and David Pleasance on today and Trevor's actually done quite a few articles for Amiga Future magazine. And, and they've been really interesting because he's got a unique perspective, kind of being an industry guy himself, but also being an Amiga collector. Yeah, and David, obviously, he was the MD of Commodore UK until 1994. And actually, it's quite interesting because the reason that we've got Trevor and David on together is, I mean, we've had them on both individually in the past. David obviously did his book all about Commodore and his time there um, a couple of years ago now. Well, the reason we've got them on together is they're both teaming up to do a new book all about what happened to the Amiga after the years of Commodore. And like you said, it's an interesting partnership because Trevor obviously is still very actively involved in the Amiga and he's done a lot of research due to these articles. Well, he's, he's helped done. produce hardware as yeah. well, you know. Yeah, he's actually one of the main Amiga hardware manufacturers today. And David is kind of learning this history of what happened to his baby kind of after he let go of it through Trevor. So it's going to be a really interesting collaboration. So today we're going to be joined by David and Trevor to get the story of what happened to the Amiga after Commodore. So I think, you know, for a lot of people, especially Actually, if you listen to the show, you might be like a, a console fan, you know, like Joe is, or maybe into like different systems. A lot of people just remember everyone having Amigas, and then all of a sudden one day, you just couldn't get them in Dixons or Comet anymore. They just suddenly vanished. And a lot of people don't realize kind of the turmoil and all, like you said, all these different companies that had their fingers in the pies kind of leading up to today. It's quite an interesting story, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite reflective of other stuff as well, like... Um... Acorn as well they had kind of a similar situation going into different companies and it and I think it happened to all of these big brands that really disappeared but Amiga seems to have kind of stretched it on for many many years (laughs) well we've all said you could make a movie out of like you know the Amiga history I think couldn't you Oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to be joined by David Pleasance and Trevor Dickinson talking about their new book, which is called From Vultures to Vampires, The Amiga After Commodore. They'll be on the show in around 20 minutes from now. Now, let's get straight into the stories this week. Now, we did mention about the Evercade, and uh, I've got to say, all the reviews I've seen so far have been really positive. It's actually getting glowing reviews, I think. Yeah, it seems like a really nice device. And I, I, when we were looking at this as well, I was looking at the price point, and, you know, it's 60 quid. Yeah. And I think that's really nice. They've got it in a in a really nice little collectible package. So you get these collectible cartridges. The cartridges are only 15 quid each. 
They've got multiple games on them. They come in a nice little package. And it's it's kind of nice because you get these celebrations of different companies in these cartridges. So, you know, you'll get a certain selection of games from one company. And like Namco did one, just, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. You could take them out and then swap them about. It's, it looks really nice. And it also connects to your TV. So it's a lot like a Switch. And I think the form factor as well, because um, I, I don't know about you guys, and I mean, Slope's kind of talked about this in his review as well, that he's not a big fan of kind of the, the square form factor, you know, like kind of like the DS. I actually, I agree with him that I prefer the, um, like the longer kind of Game Gear style portable device, like the Switch, for example. I find that a lot more comfortable in my hands than something that's quite cramped and small. Yeah, I, it does look like a nice little, you know, compact and it just fits, like looks like it'll fit into your palms quite nicely and kind of take them up as well. But I haven't really seen much about this. Did he mention much about the sound on them? Like, what's the sound on it? You know, that's one thing I didn't notice from his review. The, the main things he kind of covered in, in the video I was watching before is um, the things I was kind of worried about. Kind of the feel of it. Did it feel cheap and plasticky, which he said it doesn't. Yeah. The D-pad and the, the action buttons have a good response on them as well. There was a couple of things that I've seen other people mention, kind of if you're playing like Mega Drive games, for example, on it, obviously the button mm. layout is different to what you expect from a Mega Drive controller, but I guess they can't please every platform by having individual button layouts for them all. Yeah. That is true. And Ravi hit the nail on the head there as well. It, they're only 60 quid and £15 yeah. pound per cartridge. Like a lot of these kind of like mini consoles and stuff and clone consoles, they can cost hundreds of pounds. So I think that's a pretty good price point. And some of these cartridges, like the Atari collection, you're getting 20 games on there. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think the cool thing about it is, actually, when I have these emulators usually on a handheld, I'm just spend ages going through lists of stuff. And it's actually quite nice to have a little kind of curated collection where you can just pick the best out of them. Apparently, the emulation on it's really good too, which was another thing I was concerned about because uh, you know, often with these, it's quite hard to nail down all the individual emulation and make everything run smooth. But all the videos I've seen so far, people seem to be complimenting it for kind of, you know, it's obviously not up to real hardware standards, but apparently you'd be quite hard pushed to tell the difference. Yeah. And, you know, they've got some really cool collections here. They've got the Lynx one, they've got uh, Mega Cat Studios, who we've had on, Namco. Xeno Crisis and Tanglewood as well. So they've even got the new ones, but they've also got the Oliver Twins collection, which has just come out, which I think looks absolutely fantastic. And it's a charity cartridge. All the profits of the cartridge are going to go to the National Video Game Museum. And as we know, they're struggling at the moment because uh, nobody's able to actually go and visit. So there's 11 games on here. We've got Treasure Island Dizzy, uh, Fantastic Dizzy, Dizzy the Adventure, Panic Dizzy, Wonderland Dizzy. Essentially, most of the big Dizzy games seem to be on here as well. They've also got Super Robin Hood on as well, which, um, you know, being from Nottingham, that oh, kind of, yeah. you know, <laughs> resonates with us, of course. But yeah, 11 games. And I think looking at the Evercade launch lineup, I've been having 112 games, I believe it is, on launch for any system. That's a, pr- I mean, obviously a lot of these are classic rebundled games, but it's quite a nice library, especially at that affordable, you know, 15 quid for a physical product. I think it's actually pretty good value. Yeah. And also the Oliver Twins have been really busy recently. So their website, olivertwins.com, absolutely fantastic. They've just redone it and you can check all the games and kind of resources on there as well. It's a beautifully well done kind of historical archive. So if you want to get hold of the new uh, Oliver Twins collection, of course, we'll put a link to that and uh, everything else we talk about in this week's show in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, obviously, Ravi, you're a big fan of games like SimCity back in the day. Oh, I loved it. This is quite interesting, though. A lost Sim game has been uncovered. Now, this was something that I, I have read about before. I know over the years there's kind of been this um, story about uh, this game called Sim Refinery. That if I remember correctly, wasn't this a game that was made specifically for like a company? It was never meant to be released properly? Yeah, so as, as we know in America, there's a lot of kind of oil refineries and um, this was for Chevron. What basically happened was, um, I remember back in the days, games like Theme Park actually used to be used as like management training and stuff. So this was a special game that was made just for Chevron and a retired chemical engineer from Chevron had an old floppy disk. So he, he kind of made a digital copy and uploaded it onto archive.org. And it's a really weird game. It kind of looks exactly like the early version of SimCity, um, but it's all (laughs) (laughs) refinery-based. Sounds fun. Yeah, it looks pretty obscure. I I, I don't think there's going to be loads of people going for it. But um, (laughs) if you're a Maxis fan, then this is just one to add to the kind of selection. Because I remember there were so many ones. Uh, Sim Safari, there were sim ants there was a sim farm as well so 
you know, if you're doing a complete kind of video of all the sim games, this would be a great one to add in. Because apparently Maxis, they, I'm reading the article here, apparently they got like a lot of requests after SimCity came out uh, from companies who wanted like a simulation game for their industry. And for some reason they agreed to do it for Chevron and Will Wright was talking about it, saying essentially this game is a simulation of Chevron's refinery operation, all about the people in the company showing how a refinery works. So it wasn't really so much for the engineers. It was more for people like the accountants and the managers who walked through the refinery every day but didn't know what all the pipes and things were carrying. So the idea was that they would learn more about the refinery by playing the game. That's awesome. And this game's actually been released to play. Uh, yeah, it was uploaded onto Archive and it's since kind of been taken down, but uh, people were able to download it. So I guess maybe that's because of Chevron or maybe <laughs> Maxis <laughs> won it down or something, but it is out there. And apparently from what I'm reading, it, was, um, it wasn't really a very finished product um, by the version that was on archive.org. It was kind of more of a, you know, an early beta. Again, like you said, for Maxis Collectors, really cool that it's out there. And I imagine, you know, obviously, if, if anything gets uploaded to the internet for even five seconds, there are copies out there afterwards, aren't there? Totally. Now, I know, Ravi, you're going to be really excited about this next story, being our... Uh, our resident Vectrex fan, even though you haven't actually got a Vectrex, every time that we go, it's like a retro gaming event, you're normally just swarming around the Vectrex machines. Yeah, and uh, this is a device which will enable me to have a Vectrex. So it's called the Scope Trex, which is absolutely awesome. And as we know, Vectrexes are always kind of dying. Um, they're, they're very hard machines to maintain. Um, and oscilloscopes are... are available for every nerd online <laughs> quite a lot of people have oscilloscopes so um what this is is it's an actual pcb that plugs into the oscilloscope and it basically enables you to play vectrex games on there so it draws them in the kind of vector way that the vectrex would but also it's got a ay chip on there as well so you can get the full kind of sound coming out there you could probably even put the overlays on there if it was uh, <laughs> the right size as well so hold, hold on a minute i'm not an educated man so what's an oscilloscope <laughs> uh, an oscilloscope is um oh it's it's for reading kind of uh <laughs> is it, you know, you know... <laughs> <laughs> hey well you know, it's, yeah, good, yeah, it's good to see we're all in the same boat <laughs> Well, essentially, it's for um, reading signal voltages. You've probably seen it. It's kind oh, of okay. these um, these little devices that you get and you get squiggly lines kind of wobbling around the screen when the voltage oh, okay. increases. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean now. I love how you had to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> for our could, you, could, you hear me, could you hear me typing into Wikipedia in the background? <laughs> 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 no, I know what you mean now. That's cool, though. Yeah, but I, I guess but, I mean, yeah, a lot um, of these are based on like CRTs as well, aren't they? So it's um, and, and they have got that kind of look that the Vectrex has got. Yeah, and like people would originally be playing kind of Pong on them. Yeah. And uh, that, there'd always be kind of weird versions. Like, I think there's even Doom for the oscilloscope. Of yeah. course, there's <laughs> going to be Doom for it. But, um, <laughs> another thing as well is the uh, controller as well, which was a, a little kind of set of analog joysticks. And uh, this is actually made a little board, a custom board, and they've put a dual shock style thumbstick in there, which That's looks amazing. absolutely <laughs> wicked. So. You can basically create a, a Vectrex at home with all the kind of spare bits that you've got, but also use your scope for demos and stuff like that. So <laughs> I'm really interested actually getting it now that I know what an oscilloscope is. <laughs> Just can't pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. <I'm> <laughs> Again, I, I always love anything like this where, because I mean, like you said, you know, Vectrex, they're actually quite difficult to get and quite pricey now to get kind of original Vectrex at work. Um, because, you know, so many of them based on, you know, CRTs and, uh, you know, if one component in there breaks, I mean, they are quite repairable, I imagine, but because they're so big, yeah. trying to transport them around and everything is probably not the easiest. So good way to actually be able to get one at home. So again, it's one of these systems that you probably, it's quite hard to emulate that, I imagine, on a PC and get it looking right. Yeah, totally. And he's kind of released the um, schematics uh, uh for this motherboard replica for free uh full schematics which is awesome because this might mean people might do this in a fpga in the future you might end up getting a kind of really small implementation that you can just pop on your scope and then uh be able to play some games but I, i'm loving the ay chip as well because a lot of people at the moment um like c tricks and stuff have started playing with uh vectrex and trying to get the sound out of it as well well i look forward to the video of you uh, making your own revy 
<laughs> yeah, I just need to get one of these heavy oscilloscopes delivered to my house first. I was going to say, it could be a cheaper option because I've just looked on eBay how much Vectrex are going for these days. <laughs> yeah. How much are oscilloscopes <laughs> going for? Uh, I'll have a look. <laughs> <laughs> Keep us updated, Joe. Uh, I will do, I will do. Now, obviously, in lockdown at the moment, I mean, I've actually just caught a little glimpse of myself in the reflection in the window with my, uh, my, my COVID haircut. Um, <laughs> and my mate is in the next room. He's actually got his hair in a ponytail at the moment. He's got a little bun tied up on his head. Is it like Fry Attack? <laughs> I look a bit like a scarecrow, actually, at the moment. Um, <laughs> but it's like, obviously, we've had a lot more time to do things. I mean, a lot of people have kind of been enjoying themselves a little bit at home, a bit more time to play games, spend time with the family. And actually, this is quite an interesting little study. Um, there's actually been a retro gaming comeback. Now, a lot of people, it turns out, by this um, new report con- conducted by a company called U-Switch, Apparently, a lot of people have been checking Google for retro games a lot more than had been before lockdown. They reckon that apparently Theme Hospital, which is one of the most searched for retro games in the UK, as of last month, apparently it was up 235%. A lot of searches. Apparently, wow. things like The Sims and Roller Coaster Tycoon have started making the, uh, the top lists of retro games that are trending in, uh, in Google as well. So it kind of seems that, I mean, they've got this quote here by um, the, the, the guy who's done this study at U-Switch. He goes, it's not surprising that people are looking for games to play at home. However, what really surprises him is that people aren't looking for new games. Instead, they're looking at retro games and nostalgia, which I thought was quite an interesting little uh, little turn up, you know, that generally people are not into retro gaming and are starting to look for these titles now. I feel like, you know, these 800,000 searches, it says according to this article, might all just be my wife. Because if she <laughs> has been on furlough now for three months and she's been playing Roller Coaster Tycoon, The Sims, and Freem Hospital, which I thought was really interesting now that it was three games. Yeah, and all searches so, come from Nottingham. Yeah, and all, all of them have come from Nottingham. No, that's crazy, that is. Uh, but it's those particular games as well, like the Sim games, essentially, which I thought was really interesting. I wonder if it's got anything to do with like this resurgence of like, you know, Two Point Hospital as well, which is kind yeah. of like the mm. sort of, you know, sequel to Theme Hospital. Well, maybe really hospitals cool. are so horrible at the moment, people want to have some kind of fun there or, or, they're, or yeah. they're thinking like or what, people what game did I much. play in the past that completely <laughs> wasted a load of time <laughs> you know that's what I think it might be because you know when, when you're working all day and everything you know generally I mean obviously we're all still us, us guys are all still working at the moment so it probably doesn't apply as much to us um, but I mean generally it's just kind of pick up and play half an hour games that I get you know if I've got a week off for example mm. I probably will be more inclined mm. to sit down with the game that is a bit more in-depth and it's going to take up a bit more time. So, I mean, generally you might not get time to really put the effort into something like Roller Coaster Tycoon, but if you're off work, you probably would. Yeah, yeah. that's a good yeah. point, actually, because it's not exactly a pick-up and play for yeah. a half an hour or something. that you, you get really stuck into these kind of games, which kind of puts me off sometimes just because of with working all the time and stuff like that. You do just want to pick up and just shoot somebody or something usually when you play a game. <laughs> Is work going that bad, Joe? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. I, I tried to get into theme park again. It was actually before Christmas. I sat down, I looked at like, you know, the empty map and I was like, oh, I just can't be bothered. I can't be bothered to start from this point. <laughs> yeah, it can be a bit overwhelming. Yeah, I, I think also if you haven't played games for years, then you're not going to be like, right, let's just whip out Minecraft yeah. and start <laughs> connect to a yeah. server. You know, it's going to be like, oh, Roller Coaster Tycoon. I remember that. I've yeah. noticed it with a lot of people on my Facebook Facebook timeline seem to be listening to like you know music they loved when they were a kid and all that like, again and sharing albums and everything there probably is like an element of just kind of wanting to return to happier times kind of thing I guess yeah yeah yeah, yeah absolutely I wonder if it's like you know people emptying attics and old yeah. garages and stuff as well while we've been in lockdown and just kind of finding some of the boxes to these old games and having no way of playing them now and just being like oh I wonder if I can play that online or something now, before we get into our chat this week, all about the Amiga after Commodore, um, I thought this was a cool little story as well. Fantasy Star. Um, now, obviously, that was a huge game on the Master System, wasn't it, when it came out back in the late 80s? Well, you might. there's an interesting story here about the fact that it's got an English patch, and this has been 14 years in the making. Now, a lot of people might be thinking, well, the game came out in English as well, but because back then, you remember back in the day, a lot of these video games that were made in Japan generally were translated to English by, you know, people that were working there in Japan who didn't know English language very well. There's no, nothing like, you know, Google Translate available then. So really, they had to do their kind of closest approximation of what English sentences were. And obviously, there are some infamous ones, like you know, Nintendo's Pro Wrestling, and um, when you win that, a winner is you. We've obviously got, you all, know... Um, all your base are belong to us. Yeah, then there's uh, X-Men Welcome to Die. And uh, congratulations in a... 
Ghostbusters for the NES. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of them back then. And it turned out that Fantasy Star was one of those games that, you know, didn't have a very good English translation. So it turns out um, Frank Sifoldi is one of the guys behind this who works for the uh, Video Game History Foundation. And they've actually spent quite a long time going through it, completely rewriting the script and translating it into you know, actual proper English. So the game plays a lot better now. And um, there's a few other things they've done as well, like FM audio support. Um, they've improved stuff like, you know, there's a hair color toggle in there as well in this new fantasy style retranslation that just got released this week. So I think it's really cool, you know, to put that much effort into a game that you loved when you were a kid to kind of, you know, bring it up to modern standards and improve it. I think that shows a lot of love for the game. What I remember is a few years ago, you know, it'd be really hard to actually get some of these games. And um, Final Fantasy, I remember the really... Do you remember that, Joe? The really badly translated uh, Final Fantasy ROM hacks. Yeah, I used to play I used to play them on SNES ROM, spelt with a Z, uh, when I was about 11, 12. And yeah, like you say, <laughs> a lot of them were early fan translations from like the earlier, you know, Final Fantasy, like one through to six. And they always try to like westernize them as well. So it was like saying on this Fantasy Star 1 on the original Sega Master System, they changed potions to burgers because they're trying to like westernize (laughs) it. And yeah, like you say, the Final Fantasy games, they used to do that as well. So it's cool to see, like Dan says, to see these like people who played them when they were kids, just actually not just make the translations better, but just put them back into their kind of like original form as well. Yeah, so if you do want to give it a download, I'll, of course, put the links to that and all the stories this week in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, obviously, summer is here, and uh, I think the weather's actually going to pick up again in the UK this weekend. I don't know about you guys. I've been spending a lot of time out in the garden, out in the sunshine recently, and there's nothing better than hanging out in your garden, maybe Nintendo Switch in your hand, and playing some of your favourite games while drinking a delicious, refreshing beer. Well, this week's show is brought to you by our very good friends at Beer 52. Now, check out this for an incredible offer. We've got, and I know your guys' eyebrows are going to raise when I say this, free beer. Are there any more magical words than that? No, I think they're the the most beautiful words you can ever (laughs) say to a man. (laughs) Well, we've got a case. Eight craft beers sourced and curated from the best breweries on the planet. All you need to do is cover £5.95 for the postage, thanks to our very good friends at Beer 52. Now, obviously, at the moment, we can't go out to the pub and enjoy beer garden there, so why not have Beer 52 bring the beer to you? Now, each case is delivered direct to your doorstep. No need to leave the house, and if you want to stock up, now is your chance to do it. And Beer 52 are actually the world's most popular craft beer discovery club. With over 150,000 members, they send a brand new case of beer to you every single month. Now, we've all been huge fans of Beer 52. Whenever we do get together uh, and our house parties and that, generally we've got a case of Beer 52 kicking around because there is something for everybody in them, isn't there? Yeah, it's it's, it's really interesting, actually, because I'm just looking at the kind of uh, site here and they've got they've got mixed beers which is a selection of light and dark but they also have vegan friendly yeah light beers as well and that's always always a bit hard to get and they do themes as well so that means you know in the past we've done stuff like new zealand beer south africa korea american european beers as well and they're an independent british company and they're passionate about the uk craft beer scene as well and they're supporting that during this difficult period so you can kind of pick what beer you want like ravi said if dark beer is not your thing choose the light option and of course you do get a free snack. You can't have a beer without a snack, can you? And their award-winning beer magazine, Ferment, is included too. And of course, if you change your mind, you can pause it or cancel your account at any time. So we want you to have this case of eight craft beers on us. And of course, for claiming it, you'll be massively helping out the podcast by doing it. All you've got to do is head to their website right now, beer52.com forward slash retro, to get your first case of eight beers for £5.95, beer52.com forward slash retro and let's just take a moment to thank our incredible patrons i've been blown away by how many people have continued to support us on patreon uh, during these difficult times over the last few months i think we're up to what 131 people supporting us on there now yeah it's absolutely amazing and you know the whole idea of this patron is that you you get bonuses so you get an ad free episode you get backstage stuff you get the episodes early as well but you're also helping us um get a studio and the main thing about a studio is people have kind of been asking, oh, have you guys got the studio yet? But 
we want to wait until we can actually get in there properly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now's not get the best the studio time. <laughs> and get logged out, then that's going to be a bad situation. Yeah, and I mean, I've actually got all the equipment, you know, I've paid about, you know, about five grand out of my own pocket just to get all the kit ready to go in there. Um, we just need a place to rent and get, a, you know, a soundproof room built and all that, which, you know, your help is going to massively contribute to that. So we really appreciate all your support so far. And of course, we're going through everybody and giving them a shout. Eventually, in the Retro Hall of Fame, getting through as many names as we can each week. Like this week, thank you Ashley Kingston Matthew Beeman Daniel James Graeme Sinclair and Kevin Hayes who all made donations into the running of the show thank you so much for your support guys and of course we are going to be doing our patrons hangout on Sunday night this weekend as well oh, looking forward to that they're always fun yeah so if you want to get the link to that all you've got to do is support us on Patreon all the details at theretrohour.com and next we're going to get into the story of what happened to the Amiga after Commodore with this week's special guests David Pleasance and Trevor Dickinson next on the Retro Hour podcast You're listening to the Retro Owl Podcast, and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest. Now, it is my honour to welcome two very dear friends who we've both had individually on the podcast before. First time we've had them on together because we are announcing a very exciting project. So welcome to the Retro Owl Podcast, David Pleasance and Trevor Dickinson. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to this wonderful podcast that we love so much. Yep, and uh, hello from... COVID-19 lockdown in New Zealand. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's quite weird because David and I have got a glass of wine on the go at the moment because it's like um, nine o'clock in the evening here. You're on a coffee, I think, Trevor, because it's the start of the day over there for you. Uh, I've got my daily squeeze juice from my wife (laughs) (laughs) and it's early. (laughs) We appreciate you joining us so early in the morning, Trevor. Um, Now, it is really exciting to have you both on the line because um, obviously I'm sure our audience know, David, you used to be the managing director of Commodore UK and you wrote a book. So we were talking, it was probably about two Two years ago you were last on before Commodore the Inside Story was released which was a story all about your time at Commodore and also other people's perspectives on the Amiga Commodore as a company and it kind of charted from you know the Jack Tramiel era to the end in 1994 so how did the book go for you then because I know you've had such a good reaction from Amiga fans and Commodore fans oh it's been absolutely unbelievable um in fact I had to have a second print run because um the first print run was sold out very quickly. Um, and what's been really amazing about this is that as I've traveled around over the last 18 months, visiting many of the fantastic events that uh, the Commodore and Amiga seem to feature in, many, many people are coming up to me, asking me to uh, ask, asking to buy a book and also for me to sign it. And people coming up to me and saying how much they enjoyed the book. Um, and it's been absolutely incredible. I, I, I just can't believe how successful this has been. And I'm really proud of what, what we delivered. I think um, everybody loves it, and um, it's a very good read. And uh, yeah, I'm thrilled to bits. It's been phenomenal. Well, the reason we're here today with Trevor, of course, is because you're writing a book together now. Yeah. Well, again, it's really interesting because I would never have imagined that I had any material in order to write a follow-up book to, to uh, Commodore The Inside Story. But as I've now been back in the industry for the last three or four years and I meet so many people, I'm learning loads and loads of more, uh, more information, and more stories. And what I think there is a massive um, need for in our community is to find out what has happened since uh, ESCOM bought the, uh, the assets from Commodore in the auction in New York, which I was actually at, um, what happened how ESCOM basically screwed things up. Then it, then all the different um, companies that it, it uh, the Commodore assets, uh, whether it be IPs or trademarks or logos or what have you, they all got, um, I guess, uh, it was being scavenged by lots of different people who wanted to get hold of certain things, mostly for greed purposes. Uh, that's my opinion at the moment. Um, but it, the, the thing is that, it all led into many lawsuits and uh, cease and desist orders and various other things, which in a, in a way was, was very detrimental to our community. And I'm, I've started to, to research and record how those things happened, who was involved, uh, what the reasons were for and so on, so that we end up with a very um, a true story of exactly what happened. And, and in fact, of course, some of the lawsuits are still current. Okay, um, but then, then the idea of the book is that towards the end, in spite of all of those incredible 
um, altercations and, uh, and, and, er and eruptions that were happening, the technical people within our industry have come up with some of the most wonderful products. Uh, in fact, um, some of the products I've seen are, are better technical specs than I saw at Commodore. And so it's kind of a, a juxtaposition that we've got on the one hand all of this um, uh, drama going on, court courtrooms and so on and so forth, and yet in spite of all of that, we have some wonderful products being released. So it's a very interesting story. With I hope hope towards the end, it comes into a, it's a nice story. So I know Trevor, you were probably the same as me. I, I was a big Amiga fan in the early nineties. Then when it got to that stage when Commodore went bust. It was a really difficult time to be an Amiga user. And I hung in there. The, the Amiga 1200 was my main computer until around 2001, I think. And we Ooh. saw it go through a series of so many different companies in really quick succession. And, I mean, you could, you could say that the optimism was always there, but it wasn't an easy time to be an Amiga user back then. It's interesting that you used your Amiga 1200 until about 2001. It was the same with me, my Amiga 4000, a system I towered myself. I used that for, for business, and I used Amigas in my business, 2000s, 3000s, and 4000s, uh, up to about 2001. And, and it, it, for me, uh, I started you know, sort of pining for the, the good old days, we're in about 2004 and five. And I started doing research, looking at uh, uh, the, the Amiga you know, what happened after Commodore. And it was actually a, a, a Total Amiga magazine in the UK that got me really into it. I started reading back back issues of that. And I, I, I wanted to uh, embrace anything that was an Amiga. And uh, as David said, you know, it's, I, I would say that not all companies were greedy, David. I would say people had real genuine plans to rebuild the Amiga uh, platform. And uh, some, were, some were definitely uh, hoaxes but the vast majority of people spend a lot of time, money, and effort trying to, to uh, recreate the Amiga dream. And, and I always want to say Amiga dream, it always sounds a bit strange, but but it, it really was. If you're an Amiga today, dating back to the 80s and 90s, I mean, it was a it was a fantastic time for computing before computers became really a commodity. And today, computers are a commodity. But uh, that that's Amiga spirit that's that lives on with uh, the Amiga enthusiasts that really, have, uh, and Dave is correct, has really kept the Amiga alive because, let's face it, it should have died and gone, it disappeared. Yeah. But it's the community that's really kept it alive and a few companies as well that, that have hung in there, uh, mainly for, <laughs> I've got to say, I wish it was for profit, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but mainly for, uh, you know, for keeping, keeping the, the spirit of the Amiga alive and obviously uh, driving forward. And so, uh, it, from my own perspective, uh, my involvement with, uh, let's say, modern Amigas in all their wonderful flavors is, is driven by a, a deep-seated passion to see the Amiga continue uh, in, in one form or another. Well, a lot of our listeners may be, you know, knew about the Amiga. There might have been console fans back then. Maybe they had, like, an Amiga 500 with a Batman pack or an Amiga 1200. and may have wondered, you know, the Amiga disappeared from the store shelves. What happened to it? Where did it go? And at the end of your last book, David, you got to the auction when Commodore UK was bidding to buy the assets of Commodore International. Like you mentioned then, it actually ended up with ESCOM. So let's kind of pick your story up from there. After that auction in New York, what happened next with Commodore UK? Because if I remember correctly, you, you did keep operating for a while after ESCOM bought the Amiga and Commodore. Uh, yes, indeed, Dan. You're absolutely right. Um it transpires that um, Commodore UK was the most profitable subsidiary of Commodore in the world for quite a long time. And um, the only reason I'm saying that is because it meant that um, even though our parent company went uh, under and then very quickly, one after another, all the other subsidiaries went, because we had a healthy bank balance and we had a really solid business, um, we were able to buy inventory from the subsidiaries as they went under and continue trading. We were obviously, uh, the story is fairly well known, that Colin Proudfoot, who was my co-MD, my financial guy and myself, we really wanted to buy the assets because we had a vision of what we could do with Commodore and particularly with the Amiga, um, which must have had some merit at, in its day because we raised $50 million dollars. Uh, and that's in 94 or 5. I mean, you try and raise $50 million today, it's virtually impossible. Anyway, the, the story is, of course, that 
we got cheated out of it. Um, but we went to see Manfred Schmidt, who was the uh, founder and managing director of ESCOM, and we suggested that it might be a worthwhile thing for him to consider buying Commodore UK as a going concern. And there, there were a number of reasons for that. One was that because we were still trading. Um, secondly, we offered him the opportunity to utilize some tax credits that we had built up over several years of trading that he would, would have been able to utilize. And we're talking about £6 million worth of tax credits, which in effect would have meant that he could have probably turned over, I'm guessing, probably 18 or 20 million before he had to pay any tax uh, on it, just by putting the same business he had through the UK UK Commodore business. But uh, he tried to, and I think this is probably indicative of them as a company, he, he tried to blackmail Colin and I, and he said you know, that I will buy Commodore UK, but only if you and Colin work for me. And frankly, we didn't want to work for him. And then he said, well, in that case, then he said, you'll have to go back and tell all your employees that they're out, of, they're out of a job because you turned me down. And Colin turned back around to him and said, now you know why we don't want to work for you. That was an exact example of what he was like. Um, yeah, so, so that, that uh, we then en ended up obviously closing the business itself. Um, we ended up, we still had losses and, and um, some people didn't get paid. Um, but con uh, compared to everybody else, we were you know, by far the strongest and there were much there was much less uh, debt with Commodore UK than any other company. Do you remember that last day in Maidenhead then when you closed up and locked the building up? Uh, it, was, it was horrific. Um, when, when you're seeing people coming around like scavengers bidding for things, well, I'll give you five quid for that table and, and two quid for this and all of that. It was, um, it was horrible, really. But, but more than that, it's like because it was the end of an era. And, and for me personally, I mean, it had been such a huge part of my DNA for 12 and a half years. It's, it's really, I'm, I'm guessing, although, although thankfully I've never had uh, the feeling, but I'm guessing it must have been like losing a child. Well, I know the auction process lasted a long time. It was about a year from memory. And all the time that the magazines were keeping really optimistic about it. And then when we learned the ESCOM was buying the Amiga. And now, Trevor, you've written extensively about, you know, the kind of post-Commodore era before. So ESCOM, I mean, for people that might not be familiar with them, they were a German PC manufacturer. Yeah, they, were, they were probably the largest uh, or second largest uh, PC manufacturer in Europe. And they bought out the silica stores uh, in the UK. Uh, I think they bought a hundred and odd stores. Uh, and Rumblows, um, if I remember correctly. Yes. Yeah. And Rumblows, yeah. And uh, uh, in fact, my first my first PC was an ESCOM PC bought from one of those stores, actually in Irvine in Scotland, where I was living at the time. What a piece of junk! Sorry, I shouldn't say that; it's unfair. <laughs> but it, 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 you know, I, I got it. I thought it was the the latest and greatest, uh, and, uh, and then I stopped using it and went back to my four thousand. To be honest, it was not very good. Uh, but the thing the thing was the 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 length of time it took ESCOM to buy uh, Commodore. Within a year, they were bust. Well, that ESCOM era, though, was interesting because I remember, you know, we all thought, right, it's been saved. A big company's bought the Amiga now. And they set up their own subsidiary called Amiga Technologies, That's correct. which was there just to focus on the Amiga. What did Amiga Technologies achieve in that year and what did they actually do? Uh, well, they produced this thing called the Walker. Did you ever see that? It looked like a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, right? it looked like uh, a cross between a vacuum cleaner, Darth Vader's helmet, and K9 Doctor Who's metal, metal dog. <laughs> but I did get to see the Walker at, yeah. uh, at uh, the World of Amiga show in, I, th I can't remember, it was Earl's Court or Hammersmith or somewhere. Uh, and I hated it. I really loathed it. But, but uh, just the look and everything about it. However, today it would be really cool to own one because it's they're so yeah. unusual. Uh, but yes, I've seen people Amiga. doing 3D printed versions of it and things online, making their own walkers. Mm. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, Justin Vaughan has got one, a very good one, actually, beautifully made, um, really lovely one. But listen, I think I think we should just let your audience know how how it is that Trevor and I are working together, co-authoring on the book, and and how that came about is that I I sent um, messages to everybody that I could think of who were involved in one way or another. Um, in the post-Commodore uh, 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 days. And, of course, Trevor being involved with AEON and so on and so forth. 
So I, I wrote to him and said, look, Trevor, I'm thinking of writing a book about everything that happened post-Commodore. Um, and, of course, you figured very, uh, very highly in it. Um, is it okay if um, I interview you and uh, you tell your story? And then we'll take it from there. And then Trevor came back to me and he said, well, as a matter of fact, he said, I've got a, a massive amount of information that I've gathered over the last 25 years, which may save you a huge amount of work. Um, which, of course, and he said, so how about we co-author? And, of course, for me, that was the most per perfect thing because not only does that work from a business point of view, Trevor and I have been very good friends from the very first second we met, and it's a natural um, a blending of, 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 of different skills and talents. Um, so for me, it's an absolute thrill to have, have Trevor involved in the co-authorship of the book. And it also means that what's going to happen is that we'll have all of the um, the actual information that, that Trevor's gathered um, supplemented by interviews with all the people who are going to talk about their experiences as of today. So we, we have a very broad perspective of the story from then and from now point of view. And I think that will be intriguing to the readers and, and from what i've been told the uh, our community the, our potential audience they're gagging to find out about all of this stuff so i think we're on a real winner in providing the information that so many people are looking for but i i've i what interests me and uh, why i was quite keen to get involved is when you start a business you know most businesses fail that's the fact of life and the um, the omega Commodore and the Amiga generated a business which was worldwide. I mean, we know it. It was it was a well known worldwide business. The Commodore brand was a was you know well known. But what it's done it, that business after it died, it spawned so many other uh, businesses and people that that maybe they weren't successful with Commodore and Amiga after it, you know with the the relaunch of the Amiga, but they went on to you know other um, you know, greater things and are still contributing to. Well, society and you know uh, uh, technology today, and you just look at a few of them, like John John Bulmer of Scala. I mean, Scala became you know one of the preeminent digital science companies in the world. Still, probably one of the most recognisable names, and he went on to be, become a humanitarian, creating uh, solar ovens for Africa, for example, um, and, and various other things. But there are, not, there are a lot of people that created a business supporting the Amiga have gone on to you know, create other businesses and successful businesses and companies. Or users of the Amiga, you know, the enthusiasts that have gone on to create businesses, companies, uh, and actually new Amiga hardware in, in all of its great, you know, <laughs> glorious forms and flavors. Which is that, I think that's some of the things that David's talking about as well. I mean, it's kind of going back to that ESCOM era then. So I mean, we're kind of in the post-Commodore time now. ESCOM have got their shops. And I remember I lived in Darlington in the Northeast at the time. And this is an indication of, you know, ESCOM had a shop in Darlington next door to Burger King. And it's a small little town in the northeast of England. Probably not the kind of place if you're going to expand into the UK, it wouldn't be top of the list normally. And then I remember going in there, and I don't think they even had an Amiga in the shop. Uh, so I remember they did, they relaunched the Amiga 1200, if I remember right, as in the Magic Pack. That's right. Well, the thing is, you lived in Darlington. I was now in Durham. <laughs> yeah, and just up the road. <laughs> there was an ESCOM shop in Durham, right? So I walked in there. Uh, it's when I bought my ESCOM, actually. And the, I, actually, it came from Irvine, but it was it was built there. But it, it, I bought it in Durham. And they had a pile of A1200 magic packs stacked up in the corner, you know. Uh, and there was a the, a guy came in with his young son, and he wanted to buy a computer for his son for his schoolwork and blah, blah, blah. Uh, all the usual, you know, the kid's going to play games on it, but he wants it for his schoolwork. Uh, and uh, the, the salesman, push them so oh no they're just toys you don't want those straight to an escom machine and he was telling him how wonderful the pc was and no, i couldn't i couldn't help myself i'm sorry i jumped in i said well actually what do you want it for well he wants to do some you know word processing some spreadsheets and play some games i said well that pack there it's got everything you need that's a PC. You'd have to buy everything. You choose, and it's half the price. And it was still quite expensive, actually, mm. the 1200 mm. uh, Yeah, they put the price up for it. It was like yeah, 100 pounds more than Commodore was selling yeah. it for. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether he bought the PC or the, the, the uh, Amiga 1200, but I was just furious. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. It's a passion know. of Amiga fans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
But I know, David, you've heard similar stories recently when you've been talking to people who actually worked in ESCOM stores. Yeah, I've actually got um, uh, a, a relatively small um, chapter, I guess you'd call it, from somebody who is currently um, fairly well, but he's got his own IT business and doing very well for himself. But he actually worked for ESCOM for about a year in one of their stores. And um, I, 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 we kind of just uh, crossed paths by accident. And um, anyway, he sent me his story, which um, I mean, I'm not going to tell much about it on air because it's, it's for you to read later. But, but basically, he was saying how inept they were as, as a business and so on and so forth. Um, but I'd just like to get back to this thing about, um, you know, about uh, Amiga Technologies. And um, the interesting thing is that obviously a lot of people don't know, but the UK, we were the only, the only uh, subsidiary that put all of these packs together. And they were hugely successful. I mean, the, the, the history is there for everybody to read. And I could never understand why Commodore did not make all the other subsidiaries follow suit because our market audience, target audience, was exactly the same. But they refused to do so. But the, the interesting thing, the point that I want to make is that when, uh, whenever I met with Mary Alley in Europe, uh, he always had uh, Petro Tuchenko was his bag carrier because to carry his suitcases for him. Petro was always very derogatory about the fact that we did packs and we spent all this money and uh, all the rest of it. And the very first thing he does when he takes over Amiga Technologies is to produce a pack. And and in fact, he, he, he got two of my, my team, my ex-team. He got John Smith, who um, my probably my longest-term friend, who worked for me as a salesman. And he got Jonathan Anderson, who I actually stole from the silica shops years, uh, a few years before, because Jonathan was a terrific marketeer, and and I wanted him to join my team, so I had to go to SDL, who were my, uh, who were a distributor for me, and say, look, I know this is probably not ethical, but I want to steal one of your staff. But Jonathan was the guy that used to get all the packaging quotes and stuff like that. He was really good at that. So Petro Tchenko got both of those guys, and then they produced the magic pack which I thought was really is a nice homage to me, in effect, really. How well did they sell, though, Trevor? Do you know, did, did they have much success with these, like, post-Commodore magic packs that ESCOM released? Well, yeah, I, I, I think they sold quite a lot. I mean, in fact, and that kept the... Uh, don't forget, I mean, one of the things, and we, we can be negative about Mega Technologies, but uh, they did manage to relaunch the A1200 oh, with a few little issues and the Amiga 4000 Tower. And in fact, the Amiga 4000 Tower was, you know, was more of a product than the... Commodore 4000 Tower because that really was only just a prototype, really. Even, you know, there were only about 200, 250 ever produced. So the 4000 Tower, which a lot of those were produced. Um, so, you know, they, they, they did produce something and they did sell, but within a year, of course, of being acquired, then ESCOM go bankrupt. So, or, or have, their, have their funding, their creditors, you know, call in the, uh, the receivers, the German receivers. So, you know, it, it, who knows whether or not it would have been successful. I mean, the thing was, the computer the computer world was evolving and developing very fast. And if you can make a clone, you know, and you can make a clone cheaper somewhere else, this is what was happening. The market was being flooded by you know PC clones from Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, it, it's very difficult to become a, a manufacturer. You know, a PC manufacturer. And that's something David and I have spoken about before, the fact that especially at that time you had Intel bringing out like, you know, the 486, the Pentium, the Pentium, all within like a year or 18 months of each other. Yeah. And really then, unless you were shifting that product really quickly out your warehouses, it was essentially worthless within six months' time. And I know that brought down a lot of PC manufacturers in the mid-90s. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, and then, of course, the, the boom. I mean, we, we forget this. I mean, we talk about Amigas and we, we take it in isolation from – from what was happening in the rest of the world, there was a massive technological technological boom through the nineties, and of course, it all ended with uh, that uh, you know that that bust in the early two thousands, where all the overinflated share prices for technology stocks you know just crashed. The Nasdaq crashed, uh, and it was then the survival of the fittest. And the companies that came out of that afterwards became stronger. I mean, of course, we talk about ESCOM um, and uh, and the Gateway acquiring ESCOM. I mean, you just go into the early 2000s. <laughs> what a time to acquire the Amiga Technologies. First of January 2000, just on the on the verge of the dot-com bust. And the Millennium Bug. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, the Millennium Bug, that didn't affect the Amiga, of course. <laughs> yeah, you've also got to remember that during that time, this was the time when, um, as we were just saying, that Intel, um, 
they were creating absolute chaos in the industry because they were the only business I've ever known that used to eat its own young. It used to it used to launch a, a new chip, and then before that was exploited, before people had, had a chance to take them into stock and put them into machines and get them out there, they'd release a better one for less money. And they did this time after time after time. So that obviously caused a great deal of instability in the PC market. This is at the same time as, as ESCOM, of course, were, were having difficulties. They overreached themselves. I mean, let's be honest about it. They didn't know what they were. ESCOM did not know. Were they a manufacturer? Well, actually, they weren't. They never manufactured. They bought um, PCs in. When I spoke to them at the auction, the reason they wanted the Commodore assets is they wanted the CBM name. Because they put the Commodore name on PCs, yeah, didn't that, they? That, and they had a range yeah, that w- that made perfect sense to me to have their have their ESCOM as the low end range and bring in a slightly better spec machine, badged CBM, which they had the rights to do. That would have made for, for me reasonably good sense. They could never explain to me why they wanted the Amiga, and I think, to be honest with you, they just did it to be spiteful. I think, um, but then again, then you add to this the fact that they opened all those shops, so they didn't know if they were a manufacturer or a distributor. Then they opened all these shops, so are they a retailer as well? But, of course, in all of those shops, the people who worked in those shops, they were Amiga sales prevention officers. Well, then we get into 1996 and ESCOM goes bust. And then, I mean, I think everyone but the most hardcore Amiga fans probably dropped off at that point. Then we had a succession of these small little companies that I remember. Trevor, you might be able to fill us in on, on Viscorp. Who were they? Oh, well, Vis, uh, Viscorp. That's Bill Buck was the CEO of Viscorp. Uh, Bill Bill Buck. Uh, a number of people tried to acquire the uh, the Amiga Technologies after you know after ESCOM, and, and Bill Buck actually um, supported Amiga Technologies financially uh, for a for a short while. And if you look at one of the Amiga magazines of the day, there's a there's a front cover saying Viscorp acquires Amiga. Because he'd done a deal with the the German administrator to acquire the assets of of, uh, of Amiga, it never happened for whatever reason. It never happened. You, you have to read some of the information, uh, and uh, he 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 wanted Viscorp wanted the Amiga for a, te- a, a set top box, you know, the Amiga technology for a set top box, like um, a skybox. Yeah, you know, I guess it'd be like a T bow now, or in the states, or. Uh, a skybox now, <laughs> yeah. something like that. Um, and so it never happened, and so uh, it, that leads to another, uh, in, you know, another whole chapter of, of development, uh, which you know really into is interwoven with the whole post Commodore Amiga story. Well, I remember hearing all these stories at the time that there was going to be, you know, technological advancements with the Amiga. I remember like around the time Apple went Power PC, and then David, you've spoken in the past about this incredible technology that you saw at the end of Commodore, the Ombre chipset and the AAA. And I always wondered, you know, why ESCOM didn't work further on that. Was it the fact that they didn't have like a completed product and it was well, too much R&D? Let's be honest, they, they went bust very quickly. So, you know, you, yeah. Yeah, whatever but no, you want no, to say. No, but that's got nothing to do with it. The fact of the matter is that they, they were in Westchester at exactly the same time that Colin and I were in Westchester doing our due diligence. They never even looked. They never went to the R and D section, uh, the engineering section in Commodore Westchester. They never even set foot inside that room, so they didn't know about Ombre. Yeah. But I got, I got because it was Doctor Ed Hepler and, and a very nice uh, man he is too. And I sat down and said, "Please, can you show me something?" And he obviously cobbled together something in software, but it was mind blowing. What he what he was developing, which is as as people know, it's based around the the uh, HP RISC uh, core, and added with the three D rendering engine and the blitter and uh, five point one surround sound stereo and everything else, all built into the same. It was absolutely incredible. But because ESCOM were never really interested in Amiga, they didn't even look at it. So they let the well, engineer go. The brand. Yeah, but yeah. that's what I never yeah. understood why at the auction. When we, we said to them, let us buy the Amiga section. We'll pay you for that now. You know, if we got that. But um, they, they just did. They, they, but they had no plans for Amiga whatsoever. And I've read reports. I mean, I don't know how much you know about it, Trevor, that it was essentially up to the power or maybe more than the PlayStation was, you know, a good couple of years before that hit the mainstream market. 
Yeah, well, Dave Haney, I mean, you know, I've had several, <laughs> as we all have, several late night sessions with Dave Haney over a few drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Can't uh, remember most of them after about midnight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it gets more lucid then, doesn't it, when you when you into the early hours of the morning. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, no, I, I think what uh, Dave's saying, I mean, by today's standards, it would be dated, let's yeah. be honest. But, but for the standards of 1994, it would have been a whole, it would taken the Amiga to a whole new, you know, uh, level of, of, of excellence. Um, but, but what's, I mean, I think what's interesting is that the, the way the Amiga with its custom chipset offloading the CPU and, you know, giving discrete operations to other parts of the, of the system, it's what computers do today, do today. And we have a sound card, we have graphics cards, although we're, we're starting to get back now with some of these chips, with these systems on a chip, where these things are going back into the chip again, so the graphics is built into the into the into the main chip. But you know, it's it, it's interesting that we've seen uh, if Ombre had been successful, and if David and Colin's uh, acquisition of of Commodore had been successful, it'd be interesting to see how it would have developed. It would have been tough, I think, especially with dot com bust, because I think that would affect lots of lots of businesses. Uh, lots of businesses went out, you know, disappeared. But, you know, it, it's great to speculate, isn't it? It's great to say, what would have happened oh, if only? I mean, I wanted my Amiga 5000s. So I really wanted the Amiga 5000. I was so disappointed. You had to make your own in the end. Happen. <laughs> so I had to do it myself, didn't I? <laughs> but, but, but seriously, uh, you can only say, what if, what if this has happened? We just don't know. Hmm. Well, then we get to the late 90s. And by then you think, I remember like, posters being made like you know this mascot amiga the survivor and yeah, it was a picture of like a yeah. beaten up amiga 4000 with bandages with and it was bandages. on a crutch that was good that i like that one it was it was yeah. really good but yeah. it'd been through yeah. so much at that stage and so this user base and then eventually as you mentioned before gateway 2000 came along and again i mean this was kind of i remember that being like it was escom but on a bigger scale it was a huge american-based pc manufacturer global brand yeah. they thought you know they might have a fighting chance of getting the amiga back in the mainstream what did they want with it well, I, I I think um it's probably the same as ESCOM to start with. They would probably wanted the Amiga, the Amiga patents because uh bigger companies, you know, they're always uh getting their patent portfolios together, to protect themselves against each other. And I presume that's that was their main aim. I can't say they wanted the Commodore well, they didn't get the Commodore brand. Uh they, I don't think they knew what they were acquiring, to be honest. So they they, they acquired the patent base. But what they also acquired was these fervent Amigans <laughs> who desperately wanted a new Amiga computer. Yeah, I, I, did, I, I think um, looking, at, um, looking at Gateway, uh, as I've been doing a, a lot quite recently, um, I get the impression that they believe, and I think they, there was some substance to their beliefs, that, that putting things like an Amiga on a card to fit into a PC and a PC on a card to fit into an Amiga that kind of technology, which had been talked about, Commodore talked about it way, 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 way back. But I think they saw, as they saw the growth of the PC coming along, uh, which, I mean, let's be honest about it, the PC has taken over from virtually everything. They saw an opportunity, if they could put an Amiga on a card that goes into a PC, they've got the best of both worlds. And I think that had some merit in it. But, of course, we now know that they they were, it was a change of management and that the new manager came in and said, why are we in this and canned it all, basically? Um, well, Ted, Ted Waite, the, uh, the founder of uh, Gateway, I mean, he, he kind of kiboshed the whole, the whole... I think there was a lot of internal... I mean, it was a big company. Yes. It was a big company. I think there was a lot of internal politics going on, a lot of people jockeying for position. Uh, and if you... Uh, I'm trying to think, Jim Collis, he gave an interview a couple of years back uh, where he explained... Uh, from his perspective, why the Amiga didn't get developed by Gateway. Uh, but if you want to know about that, you need to read the book. I think it's about time that we um, told your audience uh, the name of the book. Because yeah. um, I, I'm actually thrilled to bits with the name of the book. Uh, bearing in mind that this is a story about how Commodore, its assets, Amiga and its assets, were essentially being attacked on all sides. I mean, Trevor and I have different views about this. I think it was a, a, a like a, a pack of scavengers um, trying to steal away bits 
uh, of the carcass, if you like, um, a lot for their own use. And so, somewhere, some of them, I think, had genuine um, uh, aspersions to what they were going to do with it. But it was a mess. It was definitely um, uh, court cases and what have you. Uh, but through all of that, we've come up with some incredible developments. So I've called the book From Vultures to Vampires, 25 Years of, of, of um, uh, Copyright Chaos and Technological Triumph. <laughs> now, vampires obviously refers to one of the latest Amiga developments, which is an FPGA kind of super card that you put in your Amiga and it makes it like, you know, a hundred times faster and well, more powerful graphics. You can play videos on it and everything, which is just one of many exciting developments in the Amiga world right now. I know while all this was going on, David, like, you know, this SCOM and Gateway and everything like that, you were completely out of all this sense. I mean, was this, did you know about it at the time? Were you keeping up with this or is this something you've had to catch up with in recent years? I knew absolutely zero. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, you know after after being cheated out of uh, out of our management buyout, I was truthfully battered and bruised, and I I just wanted to get completely out of the industry. I went under the radar on purpose, and I changed my whole life completely. I uh, I remarried. Uh, I married a Dominican girl. Uh, I took her and her daughter. We moved to Australia. I bought a restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, I ran it for five years, opened all sorts of other businesses, and really was completely oblivious to anything. Um, and that's why when, when I ultimately came back into the industry, which was as a direct result of being invited to be a speaker at the Amiga 30 event in Amsterdam, um, those guys asked me to, to go there. And I, I walked into this room with sort of five or 600 people and was applauded like some kind of a rock star. It was unbelievable to me because I was completely oblivious. To, I, I swear to you on my life. And then suddenly I find out that all this time, uh, while I've been away and under the radar, um, you know, people have this idea that they wished I'd been successful because maybe I would have done a better job. I don't know. But it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. But that leads me on to say when I wrote the book, because people asked me to write, tell the story, once I'd written that book, I thought, well, there's nothing else now to tell. But since I've been back in the industry since 2015, and I now meet so many people in different positions, and they're all telling me their stories about what happened, and I think there's, a, there's another book here. And so that's why, you know, and again, to be honest with you, I've been asked by many people who bought the book, say, when is the next one coming? When's the next one coming? So... I just discovered that there is this untold story that's waiting to be told in the same way that, that Commodore the Inside Story was created. And I think it's fascinating that the readers will be kind of going on a journey with you as you kind of learn all this stuff as well that you do. Yeah, and, and that's why, again, I said earlier on, it's a perfect perfect match for Trevor and I to be working together because he's got all of the solid information in chronological order. Well, most of it is. I'm still finding one or two little bits. But um, most of it's in chronological order that I want to add the juicy bits to, um, which I think will make a, a more interesting read. And people know that I don't hold back when it comes to you know, writing the juicy bits. Um, but um, oh, I, I should also mention, too, to, to your audience that actually we've launched the Kickstarter today, Friday the, uh, the 12th of June. So I can look look on it. It's going to be at uh, you find the, the Kickstarter at davidpleasance.com. And um, well, the interesting thing is that we've got uh, the, the vampire people because I named the book uh, Vultures the Vampires because, in my opinion, that the vampire is just the most fantastic technology. They've agreed to give away as a prize when the book actually comes out. Let's say it comes out in eight months' time. I don't, I can't say when exactly. But when it comes out, whatever is the latest version of the of the uh, Vampire Four standalone, that's going to be the prize to the winner. So it's, it's a fantastic thing to to link in with them on that basis. It seems now, twenty five years after Commodore, after the last Amiga was on sale in a mainstream shop, last time you could walk into like Curry's and get one of Dixon's, the community seems stronger than ever now. Yeah, but yet, there must you have look been around, a dozen. There's no other computer yeah. that attracts that kind of following. Why is that? I don't. I don't know. It's amazing. I mean, if you walk around at Amiga thirty four, there was a dozen projects going on. I mean, the Warp 060 project. Yeah, I've been I mean, here. It's incredible. Yeah, I mean, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, the the vampire project, you know, all the little sub projects. I mean, I, I'm not even talking about Aeon stuff. I mean, Aeon stuff. I mean, the uh, the table. 
the A1222 is a thousand times faster than a vampire <laughs> and it's got modern graphics and it's got plays video playback 4k and everything else you, you know with vampire can't compete with that but the vampire takes retro the retro classic amiga to perhaps one of its highest levels of classic when i say classic i mean 68k emulation in fpga and of course what's really big these days i mean what's really big is that retro craze whether it's you know sinclair's or or or, or max there's even retro pcs would you believe it yeah and they cost a lot of money now and they cost, a lot. cost about 400 uh, quid on ebay yeah i know it's crazy it, it, if it wasn't for the fact there's the there's not been a leading company out there as the figurehead of the Amiga technology there's not been and with all the court cases that's made it fractured <laughs> yeah without having that leading company you get diaspora of Amiga talent going all over in all different directions. Yeah, that, and let me ex- I think it's great. Let, let me explain the reason why I, I particularly like the Vampire. That product opens a door to a whole new market, which um, I've already discussed with the, with the Apollo guys about what that new market is. It's a whole new market that would take this technology into a whole different realm. David, for you, coming back, you know, and getting back into this in the last five Ooh. years, does it kind of blow your mind that people are still really into this stuff and how far people are taking it? Yeah, I, I think when you consider that um, the, 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 the custodians of Commodore and Amiga after, after Commodore, they've really, um, excuse my expression, but they've crapped all over the, the users and, and, the follow, <laughs> and the followers. They've, they've, treat, they've treated them yeah. with such disdain. But, and that's the whole point of the book. In spite of all of that, you know, the, the, the following, the, the community and the technical people within it are just unbelievable. But again, let's not lose sight of the fact many of these people that are working on projects today, they cut their teeth on a Commodore 64 or an Amiga 500 in, the, in, the, in their youth, and that's what got them into the business they're into now. Some of those people have got top jobs all over the world, and they love reliving their youth. Um, because it meant so much to them. And the number of people who write to me and say, David, you've got no idea what you did, not me, but they say me, what you did because you changed my life forever. And that is a community that you can't just recreate it. It spawned itself from people. We, we, we just got the right target market at the right time. It was like in the 60s, you had the music and so on and so forth. And then there was not very much at all for a long time. So when in the 80s and, and early 90s, or the, the computer uh, industry spawned itself in the games, it changed the whole generation. So never lose sight of that. That's, that's what I think is really the, kind of the kernel of the whole yeah. thing. And I think what we're seeing now, though, as well, Dave, and I, I totally agree with what you said, is that... Uh, the the retro craze is reaching fever pitch and it's not just amiga it i mean it, it it's all of the the machines that uh, and technologies that evolved from the late 70s through the 80s uh, and and you're getting a, a period now where people want to recreate some of the fun from their youth yeah. uh, and they've got uh, you know more time more talent <laughs> more experience and they're able to do that and, and so some of the things in, you know, some of the, de- again, I keep saying Mega 34, some of the uh, the developments I saw at Mega 34, so I walked around, I was, you know, mightily impressed. There's some clever people out there. Yeah, but let's be honest. Some of the- yeah, David. Yeah, let's be honest about it. What's amazing, I mean, I can't talk about this year, apart from Amiga Ireland, which was, uh, luckily it was before coronavirus. Um, but if you take all the events that we attended last year, and they're all over the world, the place, not only is it full of, of um, oldies and, and so on, they're taking their kids and their kids are getting into it as well. You see young kids playing Commodore yeah. 64s or, or Spectrums or whatever, and they're loving it. They're absolutely, because they've not experienced that before. Now, I, I, as I heard recently, somebody's reintroducing the Pong game. <laughs> <laughs> Can, yeah. I mean that's that's incredible to think that it's like that's like uh, I've gone back from from electric light bulbs. I'm now introducing the candle. <laughs> oh, 
Well, you, you know, at the moment you can walk into, well, when game reopens again, you can walk into like HMV and you can buy a Commodore 64 yeah. Mini. They're back in shops yeah, again well, now. You can, it's buy, like, you can I, buy the 64 Maxi now as well. Yeah, it's yeah of Maxi. course. Yeah. Mind you, I always think about something else when I think of Maxi, but never mind, that's <laughs> taking it somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Followed on by pad. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, especially it must like blow your mind, David. Did you think in 2020 that you'd be able to walk into a shop and buy a C64 or you'd be on a, a radio show essentially talking about your next book no, about the Amiga. Absolutely not. I mean, it, it's it's really. I don't know. It's like an it's like a, um, a Alice in Wonderland fantasy novel that somebody wrote under drugs. That's that's what it's like. It feels like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, I I just I just know. I just feel so honestly so blessed. You know, for for me, I I absolutely adored working at Commodore. It was it was my DNA. I couldn't wait to get into work every day. My team was fantastic. And we loved every second of every day. It was just amazing. Because even though, for example, um, I, I knew Nick Alexander, who was the MD of Sega. Now, in the daytime, we'd be competitors. And we'd fight like hell and to get the business. But at nighttime, we'd stand at the bar together and have a few drinks. It was just like that. And everybody knew everybody. These days, it, the whole business has changed. The software business in particular, it's all big companies uh, in suits and everybody's just a number and I, I think that's really mm-hmm. sad because so many of the people the, the great programmers they get they get spewed over by these big companies they get turned over they get contracted to, to write stuff on it with a, with a contract that is awful uh, they can't get out of the contract they don't get paid um, it wasn't like that in the old days I mean yeah there's always some of that going on but um, it, it, to be part of that college industry was absolutely awesome and and to reflect on that today uh in 2020 to think you know the position that i'm in at the moment it's just truly unbelievable well the book is called from yep. vultures to vampires live on kickstarter today what i like about it as well is when i when you first told me that you're going to write a book about the years after commodore i initially thought oh you know is it going to be a depressing read but like you said then there is yeah. a lot to be celebrated afterwards as well we we had the dark days of the, the things that went wrong but i think like you said it's a story that hasn't really been told in a complete kind of way and so is the aim of this book then to kind of get these stories again like you did in your last book from the people that were there at the time absolutely entirely that and and that's why that's why i think it's going to be such a great read because trevor's done a huge amount of the donkey work in in, in recording the things as they happened because he was into it when i wasn't um, but I'm getting I'm getting today's versions of those days from people who were involved, and I'm talking about just about everybody, that every person I've contacted so far, and said, "Look, I'm I'm writing a book that you may not come out very well out of, right. because I always tell the truth. Are you up for it?" And not one person has said no. Will you be asking Petro Chichenko? Well, I mean, I, 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 to be honest, and we can disagree here, Dave. It'd be great to have Petro's uh, uh, input on it uh, because he, not from the point of view of the acquisition of um, the, the Amiga assets, but from the period of 96 through 2000 when he was involved in various stages. It'd be interesting to hear some of those inside stories if he's willing to share them. Yeah, well, Trevor, you and I, we have discussed this and, and we've agreed that you can approach him because I won't. Uh, I, I, yeah, I and, 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 yeah. and And I'm not averse to that whatsoever. But I have got people from inside Amiga Technologies um, uh, who actually worked for them uh, giving their story as well. So it's, it's okay. not, it's not okay. going to be void. Put it that way. Um, Dan, I think we uh, we should just tell your audience um, that a, just over a week ago, um, I started another brand new initiative, which I, again, I felt was needed in, in the community. Um, we've launched the uh, definitive directory. Um, we're asking everybody who has anything whatsoever to do with Commodore and or Amiga, whether they do podcasts or, uh, or they write articles, whether they uh, manufacture something, whether they repair, uh, whether they create music or whether they create uh, video games, whatever, to send in their details. So we end up with what's basically a yellow pages uh, of everything that you, if you want to look for anything at all um, to do with the Commodore and Amiga, it'll be in the definitive directory, completely free of charge. I've asked people, it's, uh, I've got it posted on Facebook um, for the last week or so, uh, and we're. Asking, I can link that now. Show notes. You've got a form, haven't you? Yes, there's a form there. Yeah. They just uh, send in their details, and uh, then then we will make it available on my website, completely free of charge. 
it's a service that I think um, everybody needs and it will hopefully bring the community together even even more so. Well, Trevor and David, it's always amazing getting stories from you guys. I mean, you know, we, we've had many nights where we sat up till five, six in the morning chatting about this kind of thing. And I can guarantee that anyone who reads a book that you were doing together is not going to be disappointed through a lack of juicy stories, put it that way. It's going to be such a good read. It's live on Kickstarter today. Obviously, a link will be in our show notes. Go and back it if you enjoyed Commodore The Inside Story, which I know so many people did. And you want to find out what happened to this machine that, you know, we all had as kids and it was in every high street stop shop it's a really interesting story so i'm looking forward to reading it thanks for having us on dan really appreciate it it's a great opportunity next time coming up a nice time so i can have a glass of wine as well <laughs> <laughs> he technically could but yeah <laughs> maybe not the most productive day after <laughs>